Hi. I didn't get the memo about the gray. I wore blue today. Oh, We're God. kind of in the cool tone, so that's okay. Cool tones work for me. Always have. <laughs> like, it's so weird having the camera pointed in a different direction. Well, it's good. Some yeah. That was one of my first things that somebody asked, um, is it them or is it, I'm going to blame you guys for the screen being split. I don't know. If, when I talk to you right now, I see us like one square is you, one score is me. But I don't know for the people watching if we're both up there or if it fluctuates to you and then to me. There's a, when I'm talking, there's a little green outline on my square. Yes. And, when and now it's talking, me. <laughs> the little green outline on your square. And it's like, it's not us. It's, um, uh, it's each individual person too. Uh, there's a, there's a, if you if you go over your screen, there's a thing that says view up in the top right corner. Yes. If you go over your screen, that there's will, a thing um, that says change view. your view that way. So it's oh. the, the individual can change it. Okay. So somebody like somebody saying. wrote that it's so frustrating when you say that's a good face. And by the time it pans back to me, that face has changed. But yes, you can change it in your view box. Yeah. Click on how you want to see us. And then you can see us together. Well, yeah, so and I, oh, sorry. go ahead. Oh, when I post them on uh, YouTube, they are they're, side by they're side. They're split, yes. Faces at the same time, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I'll say that's a good face even when your face didn't change. Because <laughs> you just say, that's a good face when somebody's on the phone and I can't see their face. You said that to me yesterday. I know. It's like you can see them, hear them rolling their eyes just right through the ether. Yeah, yes, you can feel it. Yeah. It's go. What a week it's been already. Yeah. How are that many days in seven? It's I don't know. Um, but I was at the clinic all morning and I'll talk about that later. I had some crazy stuff happening today. Oh. But yesterday, I want to talk about this. I'm all over the map today. You should see like, the list is a mess. So <laughs> I apologize. And you're driving, the bu you're driving the bus, so. Yes. Well, the bus is going to go on that, that roller coaster today. That's all crazy because um, I couldn't oh. get anything to flow. Maybe it'll happen organically. Who knows? Trust the forks, Luke. Oh, that's so cool that you just said that because I have a patient that is a dumper. You know, when they walk into the room, they just unload all the things. There. And I've gotten better in two decades of treating patients to help deflect from the ickies. And we have a frequency TTH that helps with like icky stuff. So I would like, I'm going to pass the ball to you to explain the TTH protocol first, and then I'm going to tell you what I did with it. Okay, fine. <laughs> TTH came about because there was a patient who came up from Los Angeles, we treated her at the clinic on division for fibromyalgia. She was here for two weeks. At the end of it, she didn't have fibromyalgia. She was out of pain. She felt great. Life was good. And then six months later, she came back to the clinic like a woman on a mission. And she, we got in the treatment room and she said, okay, it's like I have a target on my back or I'm possessed or something. I got home, I felt great for like two weeks. And then I tripped going down the stairs to the laundry room and sprained my ankle. And then a week after that, my son fell off his bike and broke his arm. And then I tripped in the kitchen and sprained my wrist. And then my husband hurt his back. And it was just like one thing after another. It's like I have some sort of cooties that just attract bad things to me. And here was the kicker. She said, and I think you have a frequency that can fix that. And that was the point where I sort of backed up, you know, up against the door and said, yeah, that's kind of not my area of expertise. Yeah. So, but we do have a naturopathic student here, Ryan, who's really good at a kind of muscle testing for frequencies. Why don't you and Ryan go into room four and see what you can come up with? 
because she said it's like there's cooties that just attract ne negative things to me. So they went in and an hour later, they came back out with this list that are all AB pairs. And the, the things that Ryan described them as being are really kind of weird. So I just leave that, leave that go. And it's, so we used it on the lady every day for five days, treated her fibro at the end of the week, she was gone. And a year later she said, oh, by the way, it worked because everything's fine. It's like, okay then. So in the next couple of months before I taught these frequencies, I had to find out what they were actually doing. So I happened to have an office manager that was clairvoyant at the time. So he could see, you know, the blue field that's around everybody. And um, so David would come into the room and just with the patient's permission and stand by the door with his arms crossed and just watch as I worked and tell me what he saw when we get out in the hallway. So I'm using this set of seven frequencies, what we call tendency to have as TTH. And he's sitting there and he's watching the patient and he goes, looks down and looks up and looks down and out and down. And, and so he's doing that with his head. And 20 minutes later, we go out in the hallway. He said, what were you doing? I said, no, no, no. What did you see? And he said there was this black stuff, like little black balls and little black squiggly things. And they were flying out of the patient's field. I said, yeah, that's nice, but where did they go? So the thing I wanted to make sure was they weren't you know, on the ceiling in room three waiting to jump on me. As it turned out, he said, no, no, they went out the back wall. He said, I wouldn't want to be in the pub across the parking lot at lunchtime. So over time, it is we use them when the, the patient's history makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Nobody should have uh, murders and this and that and that. I tend to use them on patients with really scary, they, they did what? How many, really? That kind of history. And then the other kind is patients who've used drugs or alcohol. And then after that, weird stuff happens. And so I'll use it there. And I use them on myself probably two or three times a year when things that are should be easy get hard or when weird negative stuff starts happening to me that never usually happens. Right. Like, yeah, no. And I, you can call them energetic cooties. One of our practitioners has renamed them DMTO, definitely more than one, right? So it's the FSM equivalent, pardon the expression, of uh, FSM equivalent of an exorcism. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so there you go. So when I attended my first core, I was like, Whatever. come on, I'm a science guy. Give me adhesions. Show me that locks and cock slide again. Don't talk about this stuff. Yeah. But like anything in the core, you take it, you table it, you sit with it and you extract it when you need it. And so just like the emotional frequencies, I didn't, I didn't get this one. It took me years and years and years and years until that patient with that history came in and it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I didn't know where to start because there was, how does so many bad things happen to one young human? Exactly. So because I didn't know where to start, I started with TTH because I thought at the very minimum, they need, they need this. And I think of TTH like a primer, like when you're painting, everything else will stick and flow and um, absorb and do what it's supposed to do a little better once you got that stuff out of the way. Good plan. 
But today, no, yesterday, I ran it on myself with stickies while I treated the patient that normally dumps all the stuff on me. This is a patient that has a crazy history, not like the first one, but where I have to put her at the end of my day because I can't think or function after I treat them. Oh, it wipes oh, me out. Brilliant. So yeah. I figured I, I don't, I can't just go home. I have to see another patient after her. What can I do to try to block it? And so I just put the stickies on my, on my back and she's like, Oh, are you treating yourself while you're treating me? I'm like, yeah, my back's just a bit icky right now. I didn't want to tell her. <laughs> You're possessed and I don't want to get it. <laughs> but it really helped. And I, you know, we talk about working stoned or sometimes like we feel the effects of the frequencies. And I don't know how, what your experience is. Like you probably still feel, you can feel when it's working before it works, right? That's kind of all I can. Sometimes I get hot. Sometimes I fall asleep sometimes eyes water yeah and I just want to curl up beside them on the table <laughs> they move <laughs> over I need this too <laughs> exactly I think I think that's what you say right it's okay to snack off the current once in a while so snack yeah um but yeah I ran it on myself um while I treated her and after and it worked very well so that was one of the things yeah. TTA. Jane says, what if tendency to have isn't, yeah, it's never about pain. Just, it's not bad luck. It's just bad stuff that things keep sabotaging them. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. I never run it with pain patients. Mm -mm. No. no, it's like, it really is, Leaf will understand this. It really is energetic entities that feed off of pain and fear and distress anguish yeah. and that's so it, it's like they they're like a magnet they draw that stuff to the patient um so that they have stuff that they like to eat right so you, know, you know and yeah, yeah it's it, it, if you're like you said give me more cytokine data the, the prostaglandin research give me data it's like there's no data with this it's just and it does, a, it does a thing, and I can't describe what it does, but it changes things. Yeah. And I, you get extra points for running it on yourself with this particular patient. Couldn't, couldn't, can't help might, or can't hurt might help. And I was just like, I need to figure something out because, um, and I've tried a lot of different tactics. I have a patient who's a counselor and we were talking about it. And she's like, you have to imagine those patients wearing an invisible backpack. And before they come in, they put all their yucky stuff in the backpack and you just leave it outside the clinic door. I've tried all these things. I've tried weird prayers and rituals and certain essential oils, nothing, nothing helps when you have that patient. And I think the longer you practice with FSM and the better you get at it, the more you get those people. <laughs> Didn't warn you, right? You you do. And you did a great job at the advance this year about the stuff that I didn't tell you. And a lot of it is very profound, deep feelings you get when you help or encounter or have your world collide with those patients' worlds. But once in a while, it's the opposite where you're like, please. I don't have the strength to deal with the unpacking. Yeah. They well, and there are there. Some of this is probably because I've been doing this for so long. Yeah. And there are patients that come in and their, their history is like, they, they just dump. It is completely tangential and random and, and it, it's the place where I say, I, I just need the history. I don't need the story. And yeah. patients of a certain type get attached to their story about things. Right. It's not just, I got uh, rear-ended in uh, 2012. It's, 
I had this terrible auto accident and then my neck hurt and then this happened and that happened and they did this and they were so mean and then the insurance company was bad and the blood was like, well, wait, wait. After the, so some of it is just stopping them in mid-flight, right. be, be polite, but stopping them in mid-flight and said, okay, so what kind of car were you driving? So you bring them back to something concrete. What kind of car would you have driving? Well, I was in a Celica, so a little car. What kind of car hit you? It was this big, what, what color was the truck? And, and, and what, what model of the truck? Oh, it was a Ford F-250, okay. And he was towing a boat. Okay, that's okay. Then we explain the physics of it. So if you can bring them out of, and still remain empathetic. Right. But I've gotten to the point where it's just too exhausting to participate in the patient's drama. Yes. I'm sorry, but I just. Yeah, no, you're right. It's it's self-care first, right? It's whatever, you gotta put your mask on before when your plane's going down, right? You put your mask on first and then you put on your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. feel like that the plane is going down and you're right, you have to put some sort of. And I'm not sure it's good for the patient. Right. So sometimes the patient is trying to convince you ahead of time that they yes. really are incurable and it's been horrible and you really, and there is a thing in pain medicine where patients who have been dismissed and maltreated increase the drama factor in order to get you to believe them about how bad it has been right and so you can objectify that by number one i believe you and living with a level seven pain it really is horrible and that doctor really was mean to you and we're not even going to talk about the two surgeries you had that so we're not even going to go there let's just go back and do this and then do that and so you validate them without participating if that makes sense yes but easier said than done sometimes oh, right it, like... took, it took me 10 years and it was exhausting it's it's the same process that you just described it's yeah. it's exhausting a um, so, couple comments here. People were saying um, under the label tendency to have on the advanced sheet says tendency to have chronic pain. Are those the seven frequency pairs you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Um, I always saw it TTH meant tendency to have chronic pain. Well, kind of, but it's it, verbally, I see that it's the tendency to have bad stuff happen. And I have one patient where I put TTH on her custom care and I just titled it bad stuff. And she knew when to run it. Right. Me did it on a regular basis. So it was, um, it was pretty fun. Good. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad we cleared that up. So going back to science, because we have to have a mixture of both. I want to talk about nine on channel A, that's histamine. Yeah. So I get questions all the time in the sports course. I thought like nine histamine, why is that in the acute um, acute protocols? <laughs> so this is where I have to do a better job teaching this part. <laughs> well, that means I have to do a better job. So there's um, there is a graphic on in the core now that didn't used to be there. I have, thanks to you, I have lots more pictures in the core. Histamine, two, two things, well, three things about histamine. Histamine is a first messenger that stimulates, that starts the inflammatory cascade. Histamine right. is the first thing, that's one. The second thing is the class C pain fibers are unmyelinated, slow, multimodal fibers, they respond to histamine, 
blood outside of a blood vessel and temperature, I think. So when there's histamine, so when patients have, so like when you have an IgG um, uh, allergy or sensitivity, an IgG, the um, IgG antibodies complex, so you have antigen antibody complexes that form sort of circulating mats. And the macrophages come along and they gobble up the antigen antibody complexes. Macrophages have very poor appetite control. They get really big and then they explode and they burp up histamine all over the place. So this isn't just in one spot. It, they're kind of gobbling them up, up everywhere. And histamine stimulates class C pain fibers. So patients who have IgG, so IgE is single antigen, single antibody, eat a shrimp, turn bright red, fall over, eat whatever, and in 60 seconds, you've got hives or your mouth is swollen. Okay, that's IgE. IgG is you just feel achy all the time and kind of stupid in the daytime, but you also can't sleep at night because histamine is a neurotransmitter. So in addition to stimulating these class C pain fibers and initiating an inflammatory response, histamine in the brain is the neurotransmitter that mediates alertness. Hence why antihistamines make you sleepy. Right? So that's histamine. Now, it, I've had under double digits of patients who came in with literally hives everywhere, like little teeny hives. And I ran allergy reaction in the blood. All the hives went away. Hmm. Looks like it works. But because I only had one machine back in the day and I just had a blue box, I didn't treat her gut. So his hives all went away. We went, yay. They were all back by the time she got to the parking lot. So she wow. came back in, we treated her again. They went away, she went out and it was like, oh, well, whatever you ate, stop eating that. And so that's when I found out that nine appears to have a real effect on histamine mediated issues. Right. And in acute injuries, we do it because Harry said so. It's well, paralysis you know, allergy reaction is that sequence. Right. Do it. Not my fault. No. <laughs> but I think I think it's great when you I think the two things why it makes sense is because it happens in the beginning of the inflammatory phase. So like for the post-op, right? If you can get your post-op patients on a custom care as soon as possible, and you're if you're in there interrupting the inflammatory cycle, that's why our patients don't bruise. They don't get that inflamed after because you cut it off at the pass. That's how I see it in my brain anyways. Well, and then there's Diana Cross's um, slides about the genes. Right. So the immediate early genes that turn on, there was, has always been the question of why is there this four hour window? Four to six, maybe eight hours. Right. Four to six for sure. Yeah. And we always had that question. It's like, why is it that? Because if you miss that window, you can speed up the healing, but they still bruise their pain levels up there. What's yeah. up with that? Diana Cross, God bless her, looked up the genes that turn on. They're turned on by tissue fragments and red blood cells. And you, they turn on immediately at the time of the injury. And these genes are off at four to seven hours. Wow. And so when you talk about shortcutting or short circuiting, 
if we're interfering with what causes those genes to turn on by treating torn and broken and trauma, allergy, inflammation, doing all of that in that four to six hour window, I have no proof. I want, I, I want somebody that can test genes that will do it for less than $3 million. Because I've talked to a com two companies that do genetic research. And I said, I have these two projects. And they go, oh, we usually do things that cost more than that. And it's like, well, okay, then bye. And they're talking, I'm willing to drop $100,000 into it just out of curiosity when we're having a good year. Right. But this guy was talking at about, about a million, million and a half. It's like, yeah, no, I'm not a drug company. Thank you. Right. Yeah. But what, so what we have to do now is just document the fact that, that post-operative and post-trauma repair happens. We don't have anything published. We just have those wonderful photographic case reports. So one of these days, if I'm very good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any, any success treating like seasonal allergies, um, preemptively with nine? Uh, can usually help. I don't know how to do it preemptively. You, you know, know what I mean? Like everybody who gets like the itchy watery eyes all plugged up in the, in the springtime, pollen is coming. There's, there's two things. Yes, you can run concussion. Yes, you can run nine, but there is a reason that God invented Claritin. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's that. It's like, I, I, I don't know. It's, I, I live very comfortably with one foot in each of each world. Yes. There's right now, if it wasn't for allopathic medicine, I wouldn't be doing this. Right. right? So right. it's like, I don't want to take Claritin. Why? It's not good for me. What makes you say that? Why? Well, yeah. I shouldn't take drugs. Don't shoot on yourself. Right. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I'm going to use Leaf's question as a segue because I do want to talk about some uh, central nervous system stuff. Hello, you two. Hello, Leaf. Quick question. Can you define the four motor centers by location? I'm going to send that to you, my little neuro, neuro geek you. <laughs> Really not. I just don't. I have no idea what they are, where they are. I hardly ever use them because I don't know what they are. 84. Yes. Um, and acupuncture cleared leaves allergies. allergies for two years. That's that thing. It didn't work on me, but I'm glad it worked on you. So the motor centers, I, they, I don't know where they are. Are they in the sensory and motor cortex or they're in the cerebellum? I don't know. So I use 92 and I use 84. Yeah. And I'm just, nope, don't know. Yeah. Ben Capoli likes them. So they've got to be good for something. Right. But he sees way more weird neurologic stuff than I do. So. Right. Yeah. So. I'm very comfortable just sticking with 84 and 92. And I think for the most part, we knock it out of the park with those. So. Pretty much. Um, but I'm always willing to try new things. Um, so one of the, I'm going to jump to the Facebook um, practitioner question that I highlighted. Okay. And it's funny because I, I like the, I like reading some of the questions and then I love reading the responses and I want to give chocolate to people who answer it correctly. <laughs> we, there has to be like a, there has to be a chocolate bar emoji that we should start using when people answer it properly and just send them a chocolate bar. Okay. Well, so here's the question. I'm going to read it out loud. Um, I'm following the supine shoulder protocol for a lady with rotator cuff tendinopathy and bursitis. When I run 40 and 396, her pain skyrockets unbearable in the tens. I'm rewatching the core to understand why this happened. Um, uh, has this happened to anyone else? It was polarized positive. Should it have been alternating? Um, 
I've never had that happen, so I have no idea. Why Me would 40 and 396 make shoulder pain worse? That's why I wanted to, that's why I picked it out because um, so some of the, the feedback that was coming was great because they see 40 and they think, oh, there must have been an infection. So those are some, I guess, reasonable hypothesis. The other um, feedback was foraminal stenosis. Yeah, that would do it. Foraminal stenosis. Yeah, chocolate for that. Yeah. Um, and the the history would would tell you about whether or not to even suspect infection. So I've seen one, maybe two cases of what um, my neurologist friend called viral plexopathy. So the patient got a virus in the nerves. It wasn't shingles, it wasn't herpes, but it's a virus that gets into the brachial plexus, but it affected both sensory and motor. And his, one of his symptoms was pain and weakness. So 40 and 396, we didn't use, but we used 61 and 160 with 396. And it took two hours, but at the end of it, his pain was gone and he had motor function back. And we were at an exhibit at, um, I can see the exhibit hall, but I can't remember the meeting. So no, that's a really good question. I don't know. Well, and I, the question was great and I, I have never, and I've been doing this not as long as you, but I've never had pain increase with 40 and 396, never in the body, any, anywhere. So yeah, I just wanted to really bad stenosis. And then it increases. Yeah. Stenosis is a good guess. I like that. Okay. Let's get to some more questions that popped up before we go any further. Oh, it's that. Um, okay. So Thad says, um, by the way, many consider histamine in the brain as a neuromodulator, i.e. it increases activity of some neurons and diminishes the activity of others when excessive or deficient in the brain, mental activity tends to be dysregulated. Well, isn't that a poetic comment? As that always is. <laughs> That's, that's great. And that, that also kind of piles on to why that makes sense and why we use that in acute, um, icky kind yeah. of uh, situations. Hey, uh, Thad, by the way, I talked to Wendell yesterday and he said, would you please just publish the paper? We're not going to do follow-up, just publish the thing. <laughs> Expletive deleted. I love published papers. Yes, please. Yes, You've please. got great data. Do it. I'll pay you. Ooh, what's the data on? Can we talk about it? Oh, they did a presentation at the symposium in 1920. 2021. 2021. In 21. It was a, it's just, was it on depression? It was on something just, and the data was brilliant. And that is great at making graphs and doing the statistics. And Wendell had the clinical people. It was, it was wonderful. Oh, cool. And that was 2021 was the virtual one. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, Kevin, sure. So then it was 2021. So then it happened. Oh, that's right. Because I remember, but I remember watching it. So I was actually watching. Um, one of the, I'm just going to jump on this really quick. One of the other um, questions that somebody had sent me is Roger Billica's neurotransmitter workshop available on the website, on your website. You have to buy it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's available. Yeah, it's available. You just go on there, sign in your account and pay your $49 and change your life forever. You never ever ever look at a person or yourself or a patient ever the same way. Ever. After you it, watch that. And it is so true. It, like you, you, And he's I, such an amazing speaker to make something like neurotransmitters that can be so complex and dry so exciting and then you get to walk and go in different corners of the room <laughs> like yeah. i don't that it was just it was unbelievable but you're right it's, it's life-changing and it doesn't matter what kind of um practice you have if you deal with humans you need to uh even even animals if you deal with living creatures 
and you get the slides and I have to tell you that I watch that presentation, watch those slides or look at the slides three, four times a year. Yeah. So you have a patient come in with a certain set of symptoms and I go and it's like, okay, you go back. And I read the dopamine section. Dopamine is my most difficult one, I think, because it's the most difficult to manipulate for me. Serotonin is easy. It's like 5-HTP, B6, go for it. Acetylcholine, phosphatidylcholine, run brain fog, increase secretions in the cortex. That's easy. Uh, serotonin, dopamine, GABA. GABA. GABA's challenging as well right and each one of them has certain nutrients that help push the biochemistry a certain way and each one of them has certain activities that will increase that neurotransmitter so if you want to increase serotonin you walk or do cross-country skiing right it's bipedal motion if you want to increase dopamine, you lift weights. You go to the gym or at home or whatever, and you lift weights. It's resistance. It's going and doing things. Right. Testosterone helps build dopamine. Mm -hmm. And serotonin, 5-HTP, that is the be flexible <laughs> party animal. It's, it's all good. That's serotonin. And GABA, GABA people, GABA is my worst neurotransmitter, ask Kevin. <laughs> um, it's GABA people love lists and they hate conflict and they're very detail oriented. And in my world, they are the most annoying people on the planet because that neurotransmitter is my worst. It's like I fought for four, five years to get it from a seven to a 22. On the break event. Wow. So I know you can change it. So there you go. Oh, that's so interesting. We could have a whole talk just about neurotransmitters. And Roger Billick is coming back. He's going to be, he's going to lecture. I don't know what he's going to lecture on, but I would listen to him read the phone book. I was just get out of my brain. I was just about to say that. And then when I say those things, my kid's like, what's a phone book? Who's that? I'm like, ooh. <laughs> but, yeah, he's just such a brilliant, um, amazing presenter. We're so lucky that he's in our world. Well, and and Neil Nathan is coming next year. So the two of them are like brothers from another mother. So yes. Three day advanced, and we have a two day symposium. And I'm I plan on using both of them extensively. So that's yes. gonna be fun. As you should. And people that go to both of those speakers. Um, it's you're welcome and I'm sorry because your brain is going to explode every time you listen to them speak almost doesn't matter what they talk about you go really it's really yes. fun and Neil Nathan has a new book um, energetic di diagnosis of energetics or something I a patient um, gifted it to me um, about a month ago so it's sitting on my um, yeah. my so to-do list he's got toxic and I have patients that, that read that and come to us because he loves FSM. And then the energetic one, I think we have a whole section in there on FSM. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. So I, I never have any idea what's going to come out of his mouth because you don't get to tell Neil what he's going to talk about. And Same it doesn't matter. Life. It's going to be brilliant. And so you just sit down and absorb and put your seatbelt on. That's kind of what I do with our speakers. They say, well, what do you want me to talk about? And it's like, well, what do you want to talk about? Yeah. So if you take a gifted, Rob DiMartino is coming back next year. What do wow. you want to talk about? And I said, well, something that you're passionate about that has, has to, it has to do with FSM. So you have to include FS in a way that FSM can be used or approached or supported. Uh, case reports, theoretical, I don't care, but something you, so this is when I do meetings, I don't pick a theme that everybody has to wrap their head around. Right. I just you, you choose. And then you get speakers that are passionate about what they do 
and go into depth and detail that I would never think of. It was, it's just so much fun. So, and it's at the same place for having yes. it. Right? Perfect. Which reminds me, the contract is downstairs in the dining room, and I have to go sign it and send it to her. If only you had a little more GABA, you would have had that on your list. It is on my list. It's just <laughs> on the dining room table because <laughs> the other things on the list came first. But I have enough serotonin that I can be flexible about which one I do first. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So funny. OK, I'm going to go back to the questions here. Um, yes, yes, yes. Can you share any info on the Mag Healy? Oh, there we go. Um, yes, Mag Healy. So, you know, the little Healy gadget that was around. It's a right from, from Time so, Waiver. Time Waiver is the company in Germany I've been working with for about five years now. And we wanted a Mac Healy that had, and the, just the software is brilliant, that had two Healy's, one that's channel A, one that's channel B in a little frame. And then we were going to have leads and all that stuff. Well, then regulatory surveillance became an issue and it's just easier to have a Pulse DMF device that is two channels. So they said write 25 or 26 protocols that you can, that are okay, useful, helpful, and safe for a consumer to use without a prescription because it's an over-the-counter device. And um, okay, so I did that. And then um, Martin worked with the regulatory people and gave those protocols um, names that are not medical. So you can't call it low back pain. He called it something else. They sent me a list. I still don't remember the list. I know what the 25 programs are because I have them written down, but it has something to do with harmony or balance or whatever, but that's the over-the-counter version is coming out first. The professional version I think will be the following year. And that's, um, I think it's still going to be Pulse DMF. I'm not sure, but that will be programmable. So it will be um, ultimately programmable. Like it's like a custom care that's a magnetic converter and the Germans already have a CE mark and they have a 510K now on the time waiver making, but it's $15,000. And I don't know what the cost of the Mag Healy is gonna be, but I'm flying to Orlando uh, the 9th of May and then the, grand opening the event is i think the 11th 12th 13th and there and then i fly home on the 14th wow yeah so and they're they're having a gala so i get to get dressed up we are fancy i'm all excited it's pretty fun that is exciting because I, I remember you talking about the dual channel um healy and that sounds yeah. very interesting well and the thing i mean God, I just love Marcus. He's so brilliant. And the concept that a, a device that's this big, powered by what is effectively a hearing aid battery, is doing quantum field analysis. And then the device is just no, just nothing that I have anything to do with will ever have that diagnostic feature. Just like no. Right. That no. <laughs> no yeah it's yeah. my 50 percent of the core is diagnosis yes yeah i don't know where the fun would be in having somebody tell me what's wrong or to just run it well let the machine just push a button and you do that and it's like it i think it's for people that aren't that i don't know i I understand the desire to like use a laser where you just have to wave it over something and that'll fix whatever it fixes. But what if yeah. it 
And, but then the, the, Kevin says, and then what if it doesn't, right? Well, and that was what I was just going to say. I mean, those of us that have been in the trenches for this for a little while, I think we, we get this addiction to it because it never not works, but you don't get slam dunks every time. It, it allows you to access the lateral recesses of your brain to try to figure out why didn't this get better? Why didn't this hold? What else could be going on? thinking about tissue in, I don't care what the origin insertion action innervation is anymore. What does the thing look like? Is it round? Is it flat? What's it next to? Is there a vessel there? What's underneath that? Like, I, um, yeah. There was, there was a, speaking of patients we had, um, I think I had her as a new patient on Monday and she was a train wreck. And she had this accident in 16 and she had this horrible arm pain and mid back pain and pain in her feet and her knees. And then that finally sort of got better and she was doing pretty good last summer. And then she went to help her mom move in December and she was lifting boxes and now all of this pain is back and there was a fair amount of drama with it. And um, it's like, and as she's talking now, she said, and my hand hurts and my elbow hurts and my shoulder hurts and in between my shoulder blades. And I'm thinking nerve pain, disc, 40 and 10, definitely 40 and 89 and concussion in Vegas. And so just from the pain diagram and I, I let her talk for 60 minutes and I said, can we just treat you now? It's right. So you run. 40 and 10 to quiet down the spinal sensitization. She had a really difficult um, uh, early childhood. So I had the option of doing 40 and 89, but I saved that for the end. So I had another machine necked to abdomen on concussion in Vegas. And then I had another machine on the same towel on the neck to the chest running the disc and then another machine set up a neck and then wrapped her arm. Nobody, she's seen chiropractors, craniosacral people, acupuncturists, nobody had done a sensory exam. Don't say it. I know it just like really. And then as I'm working on her and the arm pain is going away. So it was a seven now it's, oh, two, oh, it's, oh, okay. And then she's telling me, FSM is truth serum. She says, yeah, and in that accident, I, I tore my ribs away from my sternum. Excuse me? <laughs> it's, yeah, there's just really sore right here. It's like, well, when I did the sensory exam on the left side, same side as the arm, she had T3, 4, and 5 were just hyperesthetic. And in the accident, she, they were, she was on the left-hand side. She got hit side impact. On the left? From, uh, from the right. On the right. So slammed the left side of her head into the window. And she had all of this, oh, I can't go into Costco. I have trouble reading. I have this and that. And right? And I have these terrible headaches and it's like, mm -hmm. okay. So I, when I did the sensory exam, so then after we get rid of all this other pain, I said, wait, just a second, let's fix these ribs and just put a towel under her back towel, washcloth across those four dermatomes and just ran 40 and 396. Yeah. And then had her take a breath in and I switched the scarring in the nerve, 13 and 396. Yeah. So 40 and 396 for the non-practitioners, just inflammation in the nerve. Yeah. But she still couldn't take a deep breath. Yeah. So treat the scarring, have her inhale, exhale. And then there was one. Yeah, but it still hurts right here. At which point I switched to 40 and 89 on the one that was running neck to feet. Yeah, it still hurts right here. It's like, it's okay. It's fine. So I just switched to inflammation in the periosteum and scarring in the periosteum because what if the rib did get bruised yeah. in the process of doing the nerve traction injury? And at the end of it, 
she got referred to Dr. Rusky. So, okay. you, you know, the brain injury visual symptom, visual system symptom questionnaire, the BIVSS, mm -hmm. the short one, 18, and a diagnostic or predictive score that you're going to, it's a problem. Predictive score is, is 18 mm -hmm. on, out of, on that. Her score was 62. Wow. Amazing. She'd seen neurologists. She'd seen, and she didn't. So. It's so funny when you get frustrated, your words just like, just your brain is like, Ugh. yeah, that's incredible. But thank goodness she found you and Dr. Rusky. And um, I want to just go with what you're saying for a minute. Sometimes when we have these complex patients, that's always when we read the Facebook thing, where do I start? Where do I start? Any questions that you get, where should I start with this? Sometimes you just need to put out the fire. House is on fire. Just get the hose and start spraying some water. Then once you've calmed that down, then you can go in and try to find the hot spots and figure out the source. But this one, if I only had two machines, I would have done disc and nerve. Yeah. Treat the disc, treat the nerve. Yeah. I gave her exercises. Like her exercises were all supine with her eyes closed just to get the suboccipitals not to grab. Right. Right. Just move your eyes left and right. Yeah. So if you only have two machines, you do, you do disc and nerve. You start because her pain level is a seven in her left arm. Yeah. And you know for sure that's nerve because you used a pokey wheel and right. Right. And then the thing that I love about the clinic is I've got five machines, six, two custom cares, three precision cares and an auto care in that one room. Right. Every other room has just two precision cares, but, and so because I have so many, I can get, I'm charging people $200 an hour. So it's, I better get it done. Right. Right. So I do everything at one time and then watch as they try and figure out who they are. <laughs> And then that's when you run 40 and 89. It's like, there you go. Yes. Give them exercises. And she was only going to come the one time. And she's coming next week, four days. One to two right. hours a day. We'll put her in the gym. I yep. got my pulley. I've got, and I can give her exercises and she'll do the prone exercises. And by the end of the week, it's like you have a sprained ankle in your neck. <laughs> I know that's the best analogy. You're, you're not allowed to lift more than 10 pounds. And when you do lift anything more than two pounds, you have your elbows at your side and you right. lift things like this. Oh, okay. Yep. The first rule about bailing out a boat is to stop shooting holes in the bottom of it. <laughs> and that works for so many analogies, but I think we have a tendency to overcomplicate everything, right? 40 and 396 and 40 and 10. So quiet the activity in the cord and the peripheral nerve between those two. And sometimes I run them together. We'll take pain down. And that should always be your goal. When a patient comes in, regardless if it lasts 10 minutes or 10 days, that's a great starting place because if a patient is in pain, nothing you do. You're just fighting the tissue. Like in the old days before you even had FSM and it was like, why isn't this letting go? I'll just press harder or I'll just throw a needle in there or I'll just like adjust it or thrust something or right. Something. right? But, but right. So I think if you can just calm that down, then everything else falls into place, release the scarring when it's appropriate tell the nervous system, they don't have to be scared of moving it anymore because it's better now you know, all these little pieces. And then the other piece I had to do by text because we were so busy at the end. It, it was, she, she had to go, but the other piece of it, I did by text message. Oh, by the way, the pain is not going to stay a zero. When it comes back, I swear to you, it's not going to be worse. 
but you're going to mind it more because it's gone. Right. The next day I get a text message back. Oh boy, were you right? <laughs> and she said the left arm still is not as bad as it was. And the pain, the pain is in between my shoulder blades. And I said, yes, that's from the disc. Yeah. So it really helps to have the patient's cell phone if they text. Yeah. And it's just, I, I'm so far behind on emails. I just, I almost, I'm really sorry, but there you go. Yeah. Okay. It was fun. A couple questions came in before we um, tie up our right. loose ends. Um, I'm going to go with that just because we're just kind of on that um, nervous system. About 40 and 396 and increased pain, a thought leading to some exploration. Ooh, and I hope understood the question earlier. When peripheral afferent signal is deficient, effectively de innervated, the ganglia tend to upregulate with their sensitivity right down to where the noise is amplified and causes paresthesia, i.e., pain. Okay, so the neuropathic pain protocols mostly increase secretions on 396. So that is the true signal comes along and then the ganglia self-regulate to the right sensitivity level. Question is the case where a diminishing signal brings it down to the de-innervated level and the paresthesia arises. Question is whether any experience of transient pain when using 81 396 during the self-regulation of the ganglia Excuse me, I have to pick up my brain. It's on the back wall right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like, Thad, I love you dearly, but, huh? Okay, no, there are times if it's numb and painful, then I use 81 and 396. Numb but, and painful. Right, so numb and painful means it's denervated. Yeah. And then you, I don't know about ganglia. I'm not really entirely sure what you're talking about because it's like outside my skill set. Um, and, but that's a good point. I mean, there are times when you, you do 81 and 396, right. But 40 and 396 tends to take the pain down. Right. So maybe if it makes the pain go up, you try 81 and 396, but I'm going to go with the stenosis thing. Yeah. I don't know. I just never had pain go up with 40 and 396. And I tend to use 81 and 396. I think of it as like lubricating the nervous system highway when I'm trying to get the movement, um, sent over there or re-coordinating everything. I think that's an integral part of, of Absolutely. motor unit. That's um, how you reconnect it. I got to talk about Jane here. Oh yes. Go. Some nutrition client spoken about in the past throat tongue mouth paralysis used guaifenesin for mucus in the lungs suddenly couldn't swallow without choking again even though several sessions of fsm had gotten her back to swallowing without choking hence by treating the vagus guaifenesin affects the vagal efferent efferent okay um mm. guaifenesin was used Oh, St. Amand used it in fibromyalgia patients. And he had this idea about, um, oh, was it phosphate? Something. And how it is that guaifenesin worked on pain. And the only patient where I've had guaifenesin actually work on pain was a 40 and 10 patient. And I asked a pharmacist, it's like, why would guaifenesin work? And he said, well, in animals, guaifenesin is a central nervous system anesthetic. Mm. It is an anesthetic. So it affects NMDA receptors in neurons. And they use it to put animals to sleep for, um, what you call it, for surgeries or for whatever. Right. And it is used to thin secretions in the lungs. And I used to sell it when I was a drug rep. And I had a respiratory um, uh, physician, uh, pulmonologist tell me, oh, for goodness sake, by the time you give them enough guaifenesin to thin secretions, it's only because they're so nauseous that, right? So it does something, it does do something with the vagus. But I, I mean, vagal, Efferent, 
use acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that the vagus nerve uses. E efferent is exiting the brain, going down to the body. That is acetylcholine when it comes to the vagus. Afferent is going up to the brain. And I think that's acetylcholine as well. Hmm. Although it is affected by epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the sympathetic nervous system has a negative feedback on the vagus. I have to go back and look at the vagus um, webinar to, to make sure about those transmitter pathways. But um, yeah, just treat the vagus. Uh, NMDA receptors are the ones that it's glutamate and GABA, right? Glutamate affects the NMDA receptor and causes inflammation. GABA and, and glutamate are opposites. So GABA reduces um, glutamate. Glutamate is not your friend. And um, when you if you're, this was the other thing everybody is using was there was a big push on glutamine because it repaired the gut wall. And you're using air quotes for people who are listening. Yeah, it repaired the gut wall. And there was actually some good data and Jeff Bland had this guy on as a speaker that was using glutamine to treat his wife and her gut got better. And this was after some bad GI thing she had. So I started taking glutamine and it made me crazy, agitated, anxious, irritated. It was pretty horrible. Wow. And I didn't understand it, but I just started, stopped taking glutamine. Then I found out why. If you have a really leaky gut, so if your gut is really messed up, the glutamine leaks across, gets picked up, taken to your central nervous system, and turned into glutamate. Wow. Which is neuroinflammatory. Wow. Yeah. It's like, because I asked my, I can't remember if it was a neurologist or Billica or somebody, I said, why would it do that? Oh, well, it gets turned into glutamate. Glutamate. Wow. It, and that's a good face because <laughs> the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a deeper side channel in the rabbit hole that you can go down and there's just little, little. Yes. Yes. You put on the shelf with, with things that I will make sense eventually. Yes. I found another quote. This one isn't from Dr. Charlie Weingroff today. But I think this might be like a thing that I start doing is ending the podcast with a little quote. And this one is, it, you know, it's funny. I choose the quote. I have no idea how the podcast, the direction it's going to take, but it, it always works. Okay, here it is. Okay. I am stronger because I had to be. I am smarter because I made mistakes. I am happy because I have known sadness and now wiser because I learned all those lessons. Oh, I love that one. I love that one. Isn't that fantastic? And that is, that is, okay. Read it, again. Read it again. I am stronger because I had to be. I am smarter because I made mistakes. I am happy because I have known sadness and I am wiser because I learned all the lessons. Oh, love that one. I know that's like our, cl our closing prayer for the day. <laughs> Aww. what a great uh what a great podcast it always is great talking to you on Wednesdays so fun well talking with me yes right. yes yeah we're not talking at each other thank you for all the great questions everybody today that was that was fun that was a lot of neuro stuff my brain um was full walking in and it's like I said I have to go pick it up on that back wall so that's kind of there's smudges over by the door <laughs> <laughs> I could always try TGH to go pick it up later all right, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see y'all next Wednesday. See you next time. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and
unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.